Hello, and welcome to Partially Redacted, a podcast where we discuss privacy and security engineering and related topics. I'm your host, Sean Faulkner, and today I'm joined by Rosemary Wang, developer advocate at HashiCorp, and we'll be talking about zero trust as well as machine to machine and human to machine access and authorization. Rosemary, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me, Sean. Yeah, thanks so much for being here. Uh, maybe we can start with some intros. Who are you? What's your background? How did you end up in developer relations? And, and how did you end up where you are today? I started out as electrical engineer and fell into the cloud space. And when I mean fell, I mean, I didn't actually know what it was. Someone said, hey, you might be great at cloud at this cloud networking thing because you understand it networks on the wire. I'm like, no, I don't. I was an electrical engineering, right? I know like the, you know, digital, the transistor level sort of thing. Uh, but I fell into it and, and over time, I got asked to do some more automation on different systems, whether it be networking, infrastructure, and more. I had the title of DevOps engineer at some point. I still don't know what that means uh, sometimes, but uh, I used to work a lot on cloud computing as well as various infrastructure systems for financial services. And then over time, I decided to be a developer. So I thought to myself, hey, why not try being a software developer? That was incredibly difficult but it was really rewarding. That's where I learned a lot of the software development practices that I use today. And when I was working as a consultant, I realized I was doing a lot of open source work and it was really rewarding. I felt like it was a great fit for how I wanted to participate in the technology community. And so I said, okay, what are the things that I can do within the open source community and beyond and make a real contribution? So. That's how I ended up in developer advocacy. Part of it is education. Part of it is understanding the ecosystem, identifying where there is a technical lack um, and pushing it forward and making sure we represent our open source community. I am a developer advocate at HashiCorp today. So HashiCorp is responsible for infrastructure automation as well as a lot of tooling, open source tools that people use for cloud operations. And that's sort of the most rewarding part of my day. It's being able to talk to someone and they tell me, hey, this tool really helped me automate this. And I didn't have to spend two days doing it. Instead, I did two minutes. Yeah, that's awesome. And I love uh, I love that you went uh, transistors to cloud, to DevOps, to software engineer, open source, developer advocacy. Seems like you know the, the, the normal path <laughs> to, to find uh, your way to uh, developer relations. Yeah, I just like I joked like and I I basically went through every every I would say um IT evolution or uh, like buzzword evolution throughout the mm -hmm. years. For some reason I ended up landing on every single one of those roles and I was lucky to have those experiences. That's great. And so we we're going to be talking about, you know, zero trust infrastructure and some of the the suite of tools that HashiCorp uh, provides that you know that you have expertise in, but Maybe before we kind of dive too deep into HashiCorp's features and, and tooling specifically, we can start off with why do you think we need developer tooling for you know access and authorization at a, a backend level within someone's infrastructure? I think a lot of times when you think about developer tooling, we're thinking you know SDKs, client libraries, uh, APIs that exist for like a Stripe integration or something that's like consumer face ends up being consumer facing. And here we're kind of talking about more like strictly on the infrastructure side of, a, of a, a company's software. It's partly to do with how we treat infrastructure today. It's much easier for a developer to provision infrastructure using a public cloud provider. And it's so much easier for anyone to just retrieve whatever platform they need from a public cloud provider and not have to worry about the infrastructure itself, right? You don't have to think about it that much. Um, so I think a lot of developers are now realizing the power that they have to self-serve their own infrastructure. As a result, it makes it really difficult to make sure that the security requirements for that those components are to best practices or, or at the very least what we say secure. And you can't know everything, right? So it's not always in my interest as an engineer to know everything to know about security. And it's not my interest as an engineer to know everything about infrastructure either, right? I don't need to know everything on the network level. And so when we talk about developer tooling for access and authorization, um, most of the time that's a platform team or a team that's responsible or has subject matter expertise in infrastructure, making sure that all of these components are provisioned to best practices, 
and making sure that they're easy for developers to use. And as a result, sometimes that means internally you have to offer the right abstractions, right? So you may not want to build your own API that, for example, creates a network and you know provisions a firewall rule. That's maybe not something you want to build yourself. You might want to use something else to build that for you, and make it easy for you to surface that up to developer teams who are actually producing uh, services and applications that are generating business value. Yeah, I mean, that makes a, a lot of sense. And I think, you know, the idea of, uh, or what you mentioned there about, you know, someone might not, know everything around like the security best practices. I mean, I think we've reached a point with public cloud certainly where in modern development where it's like impossible to know everything. If you just restrict yourself to purely to AWS, there's like thousands of different products just within AWS. So the idea of someone even being a full stack developer that also understands all this like infrastructure and the best security practices around uh, security uh, for security and privacy is just like, it's an impossible task. It's just too much to possibly know. Yeah. I challenge the the best challenge that I've ever taken, and the one that I failed epically was when someone said, "Hey, make an S three bucket policy, an Amazon S three bucket policy, off the top of your head," and I couldn't do it. Anybody who can do it, like all, you know, I'm amazed. But uh, all the credit to you for learning it. But no one can remember all of these configurations and the knobs that you have to turn. Um, doesn't matter if it's AWS or even a software as a service, right? It could be like a managed, you know, continuous integration framework too you don't know what you need to know in order to configure it securely. Yeah, and, and I think opening that up to too many people within organizations, how you end up with you know an S3 bucket that's public to everybody that contains some sort of sensitive information about somebody and that happens and everybody's like points a finger at the company and like, how did this happen? And it's, and it's just like, well, you know, human error combined with too much access to something that you know maybe not everyone should necessarily have access to. So can you explain the the idea of zero trust and you know why is that important for modern security architectures? Yeah, zero trust is a term that I believe came from Google Beyond Corp. Uh, basically, it's a really interesting exercise in a scaling an organization. And what it fundamentally boils down to is trust nothing, verify everything. The idea is that when in modern security architecture, we're transmitting information over public networks, right? For better or for worse. It's really hard to have the same kind of velocity in terms of development while ensuring that you transmit everything over a private network. You've set everything up with network segmentation in mind. Um, it's just really difficult, especially when you want to take advantage of all of the new tools that are out there, right? So you have managed services for anything a developer might need, might be thinking of a database, a cache, whatever you want, um, it's out there. But the easiest way to interface with them oftentimes involves some kind of public network. And in the ad, in sort of in the security architecture we have today, we have to accommodate for those third party. When I say third party public services, that we don't otherwise interface with in a private network. So the result is that we have this thought about zero trust. The idea is that well. We don't trust anything, and we have to verify all of the access and authorization that happens within these systems because it's not a closed system anymore. And so zero trust is an exercise. I guess it started as an exercise in understanding what's the best ways that we can secure a system that is going to encompass all of these services, and they may not be in the same network. They may be over public networks as well. Yeah, so in the in the world where we don't have essentially a zero trust security model is the the typical thing where we essentially have like a security perimeter or fence around something. And then once you're inside that fence, like a firewall, essentially, you just like everybody that's there should be there. So you trust them to essentially like ac they can have access to whatever they want. And that's kind of an old model that comes from, you know, something that probably worked in an intranet on prem world when you didn't have all these like public access points, essentially. Yeah, exactly. And I think that it's important to realize that even if it is in the network, you probably shouldn't trust it either. <laughs> That's, you know, I think it's it's getting easier to infiltrate even private, some private infrastructure just because of either misconfiguration that you have or, you know, maybe you're not keeping your infrastructure up to date and the result is that someone can exploit that. So there are, it, just because you have a private, some private infrastructure doesn't mean that you're, you know, you're going to trust everything or you can trust everything. 
Yeah, I think once a, one of these vulnerabilities is detected within some sort of like piece of software and it becomes a known thing, you have a whole like uh, collection, a section of people that are out there just like testing essentially all these different networks for where is this installed and what, how can I take advantage of that? So if you're not keeping things up to date with patches and stuff, then essentially it's, it's not that hard for someone to do something really malicious and get even infiltrate your private network. So HashiCorp has, you know, a lot of different products, um, but how does like HashiCorp Vault, Boundary, Console fit into this zero trust security model that we're talking about? Yeah, that's a, there's a, basically the three open source tools um, that we, I guess, say uh, contribute to security. Um, I think the most popular one actually is Terraform, and that's more for infrastructure as code. But the, the ones that are more security focused uh, are Vault, Boundary, and Console. And the idea is that we are trying to understand access and, uh, and authorization um, between different entities. So that could be service to service. In that case, that's console. That could be human to machine or service. That's boundary. Uh, and then finally, machine to machine. And that's vault. Um, all of these sort of um, tools really address this problem of identity, right? Because you have an identity for a service, you have an identity for a machine, an identity for a human user. And you need a way to figure out whether or not the identity has access to some target. And so in the case of zero trust, a lot of these tools are providing the abstraction for you to say, okay, I don't trust anything unless it's specific identities. I have really fine grained least privilege control over who has access and what has access. And second, I'm going to verify everything by having one single point where I can audit all of these interactions. So they're all sort of focused on very like uh, identity essentially, and then uh, being an abstraction for identity and an abstraction for making sure that you're you can check essentially whether that there's access and authorization. So starting with Vault, you know what specifically is the meaning of identity there, and like what problems is it helping a company solve? Yeah. So Vault is a secrets management tool. And what it basically comes down to is that secrets exist in your environment to grant services accesses, access to other systems, right? So this could be a password, it could be a token, it could be credentials, whatever credentials you want, certificates, um, anything that's sensitive information that grants access is considered a secret. And Vault is a way for you to manage those secrets in one place. When you have a large company and you have different development teams working across different systems, it's really difficult to audit and understand where other services are accessing important pieces of information or other systems. So for example, how easy it, is it for us to say, okay, X number of applications hasn't rotated their database password since the time that they've been deployed. Um, it's not that easy for an organization to make that statement and to pull that information that quickly. So part of what Vault does is that it is offering the ability for you to audit where those secrets are in your environment, understand when they were accessed, uh, and not necessarily when they were used, but where they're going to access the specific uh, database or serve target service involved, um, and actually some in some cases rotate and revoke the secret if it's reaching an expiration time for you. And so part of the problem is it's solving is involving a dynamic secret environment. So if you have a network that's public where you're transmitting information publicly, you're connecting to a database publicly, for example, the idea is that you are able to rotate the password and therefore reduce the time that someone could use that password or use that for some kind of malicious intent. But um, Overall, that's kind of depending on how you configure Vault. It's also depending on where you're, you know, what you're, where you're storing your secrets today. Right? Sometimes you might want to, might not want to put in a central secrets management. Yeah, a, a lot. You know, when I first started my my engineering career, it was pretty common for secrets to basically just be stored within the source code or you know directly within the database, which is a bad reason for a multitude <laughs> for, for many, many reasons. But I mean, that kind of stuff still happens uh, today, uh, on, uh, sometimes by accident, but sometimes on purpose. But uh, essentially when it comes to Vault, like what are some of the best practices for you know implementing Vault to secure access and, and especially around like sensitive data like secrets? 
So certainly one of the things that we push for with Vault is to uh, make sure that it's single t- <laughs> make sure that it's isolated in its own, whether it be account, namespace, set of machines, right? Make sure that you are putting a lot, as much as you can, the best practices of security around that Vault cluster. Um, one of the things that has come up more recently is that people want to do want to deploy Vault clusters in a multi-tenant environment, right? Uh, but unless you're really adept at securing it, it's not something we advise because once someone is able to get to those secrets, right, they're able to use those secrets for something else, um, for access to systems that it's going to, uh, systems that Vault is controlling to access to. Um, but one of the things for deploying Vault is uh, to make sure that you have a cluster, right? You have multiple servers. There's uh, a whole production readiness guy we have on that. So there's the server side uh, securing the back end uh, information, the back end storage for Vault is also quite important. Although Vault itself has built in, has a built in mechanism that what we call sealing to seal the storage back end. So if Vault goes down, and someone brings it back up, Vault seals. Basically, this means that you cannot access any of the secrets until you unseal it. Um, it's very infamous in the open source community in some ways because it's uh, it requires manual unsealing as a best practice, which means you have a set of keys. Let's use Shamir's uh, key sharing, but you use a set of keys and you distribute these keys to multiple parties. And each party needs to have their key in order to unseal the vault and get mm-hmm. access to the secrets. So in terms of the best practices there for the storage backend of that contains the secrets, you have to make sure that you're A, distributing those keys uh, securely. Um, some people have joked that they put them on a piece of paper and locked them in a safe. Uh, other times, you know, you have to make sure that you are, uh, you are, you have some kind of plan to bring vault back up, right? and unseal it because it is quite a disruptive uh, operation. Um, And the other thing to do with that is that vault itself, right, should be isolated in its own environment. So those are the big key practices. There's a lot more to think about, but there's a whole production readiness checklist that I'll be sure to send over (laughs) for those who are interested. (laughs) Yeah, we can uh, include that in the the show notes. So you, I believe you said that for essentially uh, once the vault is locked, in order to unlock it, it requires multiple keys to be basically turned. So it's it's kind of like like the the nuclear uh, codes where uh, in order to you, you need multiple people basically to turn turn the key in NORAD for to to, to, yeah. to, uh, to unleash yes. the nukes. Or, I was or, about to use the analogy, but I've since been told that I'm not supposed to use that analogy. Yeah, yeah, but that's exactly yeah. what it is. Yeah, you yeah. need to you need multiple people to turn the turn the key, so to speak, and that's okay. how uh, Vault gets unsealed. So in the open source, so the, there's an open source version of Vault, and then the, I'm assuming there's also like a managed service version of it. So in the open source one, uh, you know, I guess you can tell people the best way to do these things and give them lots of documentation and so forth. But they could, they're still essentially responsible for deploying it correctly, hopefully doing it to the best practices as prescribed by HashiCorp. But you don't ultimately have control over that, right? Yep, exactly. So the open source version, you run it yourself, you have to operate it yourself. Um, and as a result, it's difficult to make sure that you have the right um, security policies in place to make sure that someone who's going to use it isn't going to compromise it. Um, a more popular pattern that I've been seeing now is uh, people deploying Vault on Kubernetes, um, Kubernetes being the container orchestrator. And that presents a whole other set of challenges because, well, Kubernetes is a Kubernetes cluster is multi-tenant. Um, and so part of the thing that we we have to uh, at least articulate and educate people on is that here are the risks that you assume if you do deploy it on Kubernetes. Um, these are the things you have to think about. So that's the trick with the open source vault. You have to understand the risks that you're taking if you do not necessarily secure the underlying machines or containers that are running it. Hey there, Sean, host of Partially Redacted. You probably guessed that since at this point in the interview, you probably recognize my voice. I've been told for years that I have a face for podcasting, but no one has mentioned whether I have a voice for podcasting, so sorry about that. Hopefully, the awesome guest makes up for it. Anyway, if you're enjoying this episode, please support the show by subscribing and telling your friends. You can also join the Partially Redacted community at skyflow.com community.
Okay, that's enough for me. Back to the show. Yeah, so, I mean, it's a lot to take on, even if you're you're offloading some of the responsibility of this by using the open source project, you're still taking on a lot of these responsibilities. So you want to make sure that you have experts in-house that, that know how to do and follow these best practices. So I think like one of the big cha- challenges I imagine, uh, or like I think that's hard to get right is like secrets rot- rotation and expiration. Can you talk a little bit about how Vault helps someone manage that process? Yeah, so Vault has this idea of a plugin system. And so you can plug in to any integration, target integration, right? And Vault has two sets of plugins, authentication methods and secrets engines. So we'll focus on the secrets engines uh, set of plugins. The idea is that in the secrets engine, you have a ton of code uh, in a secrets engine that helps you handle the rotation of some credential somewhere. Now, this is import- the important assumption of, uh, or is, I suppose, prerequisite uh, to a secrets engine is that you have an API, a target API, that can do rotation of credentials, right? So it's not sufficient to say, okay, I'm going to delete this username and password using a command line, although that does happen. Uh, it is not something that um, is advised. You do have to have some API on the other side that is able to delete and create credentials, uh, whether that be passwords, tokens, etc. cetera. Um, and so the secrets engines have built in logic for how they handle the revocation and creation of new secrets. So there's this concept called a lease in a Vault Secrets Engine. And the idea is that if you have a secret, it will time out eventually, it will expire, right? You're leasing that secret for use for a certain period of time. Once it reaches that period of time, you can choose to renew or you revoke the secret. And the behavior of how you renew or revoke will depend on the secrets engine as well as the underlying behavior that you want, right? So sometimes you want to completely revoke it. Other times you just want to renew that secret. And so the secrets rotation piece is heavily dependent on that target. A database, for example, is going to handle a database username and password revocation very differently than, let's say, maybe the Skyflow API might offer Mm -hmm. for you to do that. And so you have to keep that in mind as you use a secrets engine. Um, They're all developed and built into Vault, actually, and that's partly for security purposes. You can build your own custom secrets engines for target target systems that maybe you want to rotate the credentials for. But from a security standpoint, the built-in secrets engines are there, they're vetted, the behaviors themselves are also triple-checked to make sure that as they revoke and create new secrets, they're not going to expose those secrets. So in the, if we take the example of um, like Skyflow, where we have, say, a service account key to access Skyflow APIs, then we w- if we were storing that within a HashiCorp vault and we need to rotate it, then we need to make an, essentially an API call to the, the vault to um, probably revoke the key generate a new one, and then store that new one in, in, in HashiCorp Vault. Is that logic of making that API call, does that all live within HashiCorp Vault? Is that right? Am I understanding that? Yeah. So part of that is it's the, so the logic to rotate it will exist in your application. Mm-hmm. Uh, the logic, not not to rotate it, but the, the call to start rotation exists in the application. But the logic of handling the rotation, so for example, let's say the Skyflow service account key is, you know, I just want to change it. I want a completely new one. That logic is going to be bundled into the secrets engine, which is bundled with Vault. The idea is that all of the logic that you need in order to handle a proper rotation of a secret is going to be pushed into Vault itself, and Vault will handle that for you via that plugin. Um, There are exceptions. Uh, If you decide to store a static secret, so for example, if, you know, there's no secrets engine for Skyflow yet, I don't know. Uh, but there's no secrets engine for that yet. Maybe you want to store it statically. There is a key value store in Vault. In that case, there is no lease, right? So there's no way for you to rotate it. You will have to manually rotate it on the the application side. Oh, I see. So there's built there's basically built in uh, support for probably well known um, types of like secrets or databases and so forth. But if you're doing something that's a little more bespoke or, or maybe less mainstream, you can still do it, but you have to do a little bit of extra work essentially on your end. Exactly. So certificates, right? So you can even rotate certificates if you want. 
Mm-hmm. Um, not if depending if you have a certificate manager, that's a whole other situation. But you actually can use Vault to generate certificates, um, and that will actually handle certificate rotation, which is interesting. Um, databases are very popular. There's some APIs for you know different services that uh, people are interested in. Um, the cloud providers. So if you want uh, STS, AWS STS tokens. Uh, you know, Azure AD, there's a, a number of secrets engines related to the cloud provider credentials as well. So another tool that we mentioned when we, talk, we were talking about HashiCorp and, and helping with zero trust was HashiCorp console. Can you talk a little bit about, well, first of all, what is like application-based networking and how is that concept related to HashiCorp console? Part of console, um, that's a... Part of what is important about consoles, console at the end of the day helps with understanding the services that are running on your network. Um, it's sometimes pretty difficult to build that relationship between what service is running on what network and who owns it, right? That's why we have the, in the traditional traditional IT environment this idea of a CMDB, configuration management database. We've matched, we've somehow manually matched metadata about certain services on what machines, on what IP addresses, and that maps to a network. And that's all information that we've manually constructed for better or for worse. And by manually, I don't mean that we've gone in and typed it in. It's more like pieces of our automation have injected this metadata into the CMDB, and that's how we get the big picture. Part of what console is really helpful in doing is identifying these relationships automatically and very dynamically. So you don't have to write into your automation, okay, this service relates to this IP address. Instead, console is able to pick up the IP address and make those relationships in its service catalog. And so what it's able to do is provide one view into the services that are running uh, in your environment, wherever you set up console, and make those relationships between certain pieces of metadata, what they're running on sometimes if you add that information, as well as what IP address they have. Um, By extension, the reason why this this service catalog or this idea of application-based networking is important is that now you have the ability to control service-to-service communication because you know where these services are and how they resolve. So that's got a nice consequence in the form of service discovery as well as by extension service mesh. So you know where they resolve and you can ultimately control how traffic is shaped between these services. Can you talk a little bit about what the you know process of setting something like this up in you know a typical like enterprise environment is like? Oh yeah. It's tricky. <laughs> yeah, I imagine. It's tricky because uh, you know, most people don't want to put a tool like this into a brownfield environment, right? It's it means you have to refactor your infrastructure. Um, it's similar to introducing you know, a security agent across all of your infrastructure, right? You have to go through the, configure- the painstaking configuration and load and download of these packages. So with HashiCorp console, it's not necessarily um, the overhead to, to put it into a brownfield environment can be tricky, but ultimately people do it because they have one view of all the services in that environment. Um, so one of the, the the main architecture of console involves servers and then a data plane. So the console servers, similar to the vault servers, are a cluster that you know handle all the logic and, for the most part, um, col- you know uh, aggregates all the information about the services that get registered. Um, it also pushes configuration out to the data plane. Um, it's newer now, but there's a, a data plane concept in console where you can deploy the data plane and the data plane. Uh, has all the information about local registration of services. So let's say you've got a machine, a virtual machine. A service comes up on that virtual machine. It registers a service definition to console, the console client or data plane on that machine, and that client or data plane funnels it back to the server. And that's how you get the big picture view of all of the services but the client itself is able to understand the information that's on that local machine about that service. In in one of these uh, situations where someone does want to work with console for like a, a, a fairly large, you know, enterprise infrastructure, is there a, essentially a way to do that without like boiling the ocean to start with? Can, can they do something where they, you know, 
start simple and then and then over time actually do it across their entire infrastructure? Yeah, so I see it more often with greenfield environments. So mm -hmm. usually it comes comes down to someone is creating a new environment or creating a new cluster. Uh, we'll just take Kubernetes because that's typically from an infrastructure standpoint. That's typically what people want the service mesh capabilities for. But you know they're creating a new Kubernetes cluster. It's brand new. They need to load a set of services on it. They can deploy console onto that Kubernetes cluster and test it out, introduce it. They get initial visibility into the services on that cluster. Um, the the nice part about console is that it has a peering model where if you've done finished rolling it out to one Kubernetes cluster and you onboard other clusters or other virtual machines, you can actually create other clusters and peer them together. So let's say you have a Kubernetes cluster that you've allocated for you know, some region, we can say Europe for European purposes, right? Um, and you want to have those same services duplicated in, let's say, you, the United States. You can create a cluster in the United States and you can peer those two console clusters together and you get one single view of all those services. Um, so it's not just Kubernetes clusters. You can do this in machines across data centers as well, although it takes a little bit longer to set up the service registration as well as any server, the server components that you might need for it. But usually when people roll it out, they start with a greenfield environment and then they progressively roll it to other greenfield environments and then backport it into a brownfield environment. Awesome. And then, so we've talked about, we talked about vault, we talked about console. What about boundary? Like how does boundary simplify like remote access to critical resources, particularly in this like zero trust environment that we've been talking about? Yeah, so inevitably, as much as we talk, we love automation and we talk about all these abstractions, right? So Vault is able to say, okay, he's this machine can access this machine. We won't let this machine access this machine. Um, and in the case of console, it's saying, okay, this service can access this service or this service shouldn't be accessing this service. All of these abstractions that we have in place, uh, the one problem is that we haven't addressed a developer, right? Someone who's actually using these uh, tools and needs to debug all of this, all of the services, all of the infrastructure that happens um, to be in place. There are inevitably situations in which you have an incident, right? And you need to debug and someone needs access to production. And so that's where um, battery comes in uh, as it comes in handy. Part of it um, is that you want to grant people access to a production environment but do it in a way that you can control what they are accessing as well as how long they're accessing it. And so Boundary provides one interface for you to control, okay, which endpoints that someone can access uh, based on certain scopes. And you can also choose what targets and for how long. So if someone did need to debug a database, they have ephemeral access to that database for X amount of time for that incident, and then you can revoke that session. Um, it's kind of a, it's a, I think it, it, it falls under, I guess, privilege access management, mm -hmm. but it is an interesting tool because it's doing this in open source. Um, and part of this is also the ability to plug into other uh, systems as well. So like many of the other tools like Vault, um, there's the idea is that you can plug in and integrate with other systems so that you don't have to have the experience of just setting up the routing and everything for these remote systems. Instead, you put a worker in place and that worker can help you access that remote system. Yes. So Skyflow Data Privacy Vault uh, supports kind of a similar concept, although we're not talking about access to a machine. We're talking about access essentially to PII in this case where, but you can have essentially ephemeral access uh, for, you know, essentially, you know, maybe you can access a single record of someone's name or something like that for a certain period of time, whatever it, is, it happens to be. Um, that way, like say a customer support agent doesn't have unlimited access to all the records. They only have access to the records that are in their queue or something like that. So it makes a lot of sense in the development environment as well as like, you know, someone might need to access a server for debugging purposes, but they don't need, you know, unlimited infinite access for all time. They only need access for maybe a day or, or, or a few hours or something like that. How is the um, like how is the control set up? Like, is that some sort of policy based language? Like, how do you actually go about creating these rules that allow somebody within the organization to have access to some piece of the infrastructure? 
Yeah, so it's partly a uh, domain. So there's a, um, you can group things by scopes. So the targets are grouped into what we call scopes, and these are groupings. They're, they're abstractions of whatever grouping you want. They could be grouping of infrastructure, they could be grouped by product, they could be grouped by domain. Like you mentioned, like it could be like, this is for call center in Europe, right? So it could be say, let's say like, this is all infrastructure in Europe or service endpoints in Europe. That's the first part of it. The second part of this um, involves groups, the actual groups, not the domain model, but uh, not the scopes, but the groups themselves. And what you can do is you can give privileges based on those groups. So a group has uh, the ability to read or access the targets, authorized sessions in this particular scope. So you can assign groups to scopes. Um, you could assign groups to multiple scopes if you wanted. You can nest scopes so you can have a project level and then you can have different um, organizations as well. So uh, the, way is, the way to just segment it all is up to you. But the idea is that we, for the most part, assign a group, uh, a role to the group, and then to a scope, which is the target endpoints. Mm, okay. Yeah, so kind of similar, um, you know, RBAC type of security model that are uh, supported by other systems. And then, you know, with any of this, especially when I think when we're talking about security, it can be a challenge to balance like ease of use of the product with making sure that things are secure. So how does HashiCorp go about balancing these two, you know, tricky things of let's make sure that people are following best practices, um, that things are secure with making sure that it's actually easy to use and easy to implement. Yeah, that's always, I, I, if you figured it out, I want to know the answer to that. Because <laughs> <laughs> I feel like we're struggling with it. Um, and that's mostly because, you know, we're, we're lucky in that we have an open source community. If it's not that easy to use, someone's going to ask like, hey, this is just not that intuitive to us. Um, or, you know, we're looking for this feature and we want to access the system, but it's just not that easy for us to do that right now. So we get that feedback and part of the, part of the iteration process of us, you know, determining, okay, how easy is this tool to set up, but also whether or not it's secure enough for a production environment, you know, involves feedback from the community. Uh, when you go the open source route in any of these tools, most of the time, the best you have is the sort of documentation of how to set it up in production. Sometimes you're lucky to get, uh, you know, a module that you vetted or module, meaning some kind of deployment module that has been vetted and secure and says, okay, this is exactly the way to do it. Um, and this is the target environment and it suits your purposes. Other times you may not be so lucky. You may have an on-prem environment and you have to do this all by yourself, right? So we try to offer as much documentation as well as automation around the deployment itself that has a sort of secure by default configuration, although it's a bit of a struggle. Um, and of course, then we always take the feedback of what's an intuitive user interface, what's not so much. Um, the other thing that we always try to think about is the balance of extensibility as well as security, right? Um, people have told us, hey, why can't I just bring my own plugin and, and run it as easily as possible? Uh, whether it be Vault or, or something else. And the answer is, you don't know sometimes where plugins come from. Um, it's yeah. easy to take a, a plugin from somewhere and you don't know what that code is running. You don't know if someone's injected some um, malicious code in there. Um, it's a big problem these days that we've been thinking about uh, as an industry. But in order to make sure that we are uh, we are controlling the interactions within this code, you know, we tended to bundle the plugins with uh, the with the security tool. So for example, Vault is one of them. Boundary is also the other one, right? Um, and the it makes it difficult for extensibility. People complain sometimes and they say, I want to run it. We offer the ability for someone to run their own extensions or plugins at their own risk, right? And we have to offer that because, you know, we can't, no, not everybody can, can develop the integrations and ecosystems by themselves. Um, and so we recognize it's important for people to have extensibility, but we always preface it with, you know, make sure you're you're doing your own research and you understand the consequences of pulling a third party plugin, for example. Yeah, that makes some. I think that makes a ton of sense that you want some control or rigor around these plugins, given the sensitivity of the type of information or access that these various tools are are responsible for. You know, you look at 
something like the package management world of like on npm and there's a, that's a whole nightmare of like um uh dependency rollout that essentially you can rely on some sort of open source tool that then relies on you know 10 other open source tools that you get this huge like supply chain of open source tools and somewhere in there someone could be doing something malicious and you'd have no like necessary visibility into it and a lot of people have burned themselves with that oh yeah and i think it's a constant <laughs> it's a constant battle and you know battle with uh with trying to even keep your like keep your own dependencies and a lot of this software right keeping our own dependencies um see so all of the dependencies we use up to date too it's it's uh it's difficult but i think that's also a really nice thing about having an open source community too if someone notices something they're going to report it to you um and so it's uh it's useful as an exercise to sort of share the code and it's all out there um so if you are curious about a plugin or something you can look at it it's out there for you to review yeah and you get all that feedback as well to help improve the product so can you talk about you know, is there any upcoming features or developments in, in Vault, Boundary, or Console that, you know, people should be excited about or that you're particularly excited about? Um, You know, there's quite a lot of them. Um, I would say Console in general has a really interesting stuff around peering and federation. It's really intriguing because you're now working with individual clusters, multiple clusters at scale. Um. And so that's pretty interesting because now you run into a lot of questions around, okay, how do I want to visualize my services that are not necessarily in the same region? How do I want to group services that should be, you know, should be grouped together from a product or domain standpoint, but are across different regions, you know? Um, so there are a lot of questions around that. That's pretty fascinating. Um, it's also pretty cool to, to learn a little bit more. I've been learning a little bit more on VoI, which is part of the proxy related to service mesh. Um, and that has a lot of interesting security related, uh, in I guess, security related features for on underlying Envoy. Um, with Vault and Boundary, a lot of this is in the Kubernetes. I sit in the Kubernetes space a lot with Vault. Um, mm -hmm. And so one of the things that has been really interesting is uh, Vault on Kubernetes and using Vault to uh, keep secrets, right? And using um, Kubernetes applications to retrieve those secrets. Um, there are now four ways that you can do it. <laughs> Um, and all of them have differing security risks, so that's also pretty fascinating. And with Boundary, it's, it's I would say, one of the newer open source tools, so it's always growing. Um, it's always expanding as well. And I think one of the more recent things that's been interesting is HCP Boundary. So we offered a managed uh, Boundary offering um, through the cloud. So it's like you can just get a Boundary cluster and you could get that on demand and immediately start using it to secure endpoints uh, for your developers. That's been pretty fun to work with as well. And interestingly, you know, it's got some um, fun configurations that you can set up to. That's uh, that's exciting for develop. I think for development teams, so you can choose to use a managed service offering for remote access with you know little overhead, and use that to hop into private environments if you wanted to. Awesome. Anything else you'd like to share? Um, you know, something, if anybody has any questions, you can always reach out to me. Um, but more importantly, like, yeah, I always, I'm always, I'm not a security expert by any means. <laughs> um, I happen to come from a DevOps, the a sort of an engineering space where I had to learn security and I learned from the, you know, so the security experts who taught me. Um, and so I'm always looking for new tools and, and new ways to expand in the space. So I appreciate the opportunities anybody has to teach me about security and privacy. Awesome. And then if they, someone does want to reach out, what's the best way to contact you? They can reach me at uh, J-O-A-T-M-O-N-0-8. So that's Jack of All Trades, Master of None, 08 <laughs> on Twitter. Uh, you can also find me on LinkedIn as well. You can reach out and ask any questions that you have on HashiCorp, Vault, Boundary, Console, Terraform, any of the other tools too. Awesome. Well, thanks so much for being here. We'll include some links to those in the show notes. I learned a lot. This was super, uh, super helpful for me <laughs> at the very least. And uh, I, I think a lot of people will get a lot of value out of this. Uh, and hopefully I'll get a chance to see you, you know, sometime at, in person at a future conference or event sometime later this year. Yeah, of course. 